Chapter 1 The Secret Society One wintry afternoon in February 1891, three men were engaged in earnest conversation in London. From that conversation were to flow consequences of the greatest importance to the British Empire and to the world as a whole. The opening passage of Professor Carol Quigley's book, The Anglo-American Establishment, may read like a John Le Carre thriller, but this is no spy fiction. The three staunch British imperialists who met that day, Cecile Rhodes, William Steed, and Lord Escher, drew up a plan for the organization of a secret society that would take over the control of foreign policy, both in Britain and later, by extension, the United States of America a secret society that aimed to renew the Anglo-Saxon bond between Great Britain and the United States, spread all that they considered good in the English ruling class traditions, and expand the British Empire's influence in a world they believed they were destined to control. It was the heyday of both Jack the Ripper and Queen Victoria, the latter having confronted her anti-Semitic prejudices Began a, personal rela- began a personal friendship with a member of the Rothschild banking dynasty, which played such an important role in what was to follow. The former allegedly murdered Mary Kelly, his fifth and possibly final victim, in London's fog-bound Whitechapel slums. These two unrelated events captured the extremities of life in that era of privilege and poverty, sumptuous excess for the few, and and penniless vulnerability for the many. Despite appalling social conditions, Victoria, England, sat confidently at the pinnacle of international power, steeped as it was in the magnificence of the British Empire. But could it stay there forever? This was the driving question exercising much serious debate in the cigar-smoked-filled parlors of influence, and the plan, agreed between these three men, was essentially an affirmation that steps had to be taken to ensure that Britain maintained its dominant position in world affairs. The conspirators were well-known public figures, but it should be noted from the outset that each was linked to infinitely greater wealth and influence. The plan laid on the table was relatively simple. A secret society would be formed and run by a small, close-knit clique. The leader was to be Cecile Rhodes. He and his accomplices constructed the secret organization around concentric circles with an inner core of trusted associates, the Society of the Elect, who unquestionably knew what they were knew that they were members of an exclusive cabal devoted to taking and holding power of a worldwide scale on a worldwide scale. A second outer circle, larger and quite fluid in its membership, was to be called the Association of Helpers. At this level of involvement, members may or may not have been aware that they were either an integral part of an of or inadvertently being used by a secret society. Many of the outer edges of the group, idealists and honest politicians, may never have known that the real decisions were made by the ruthless clique about whom they had no knowledge. Professor Quigley revealed that the organization was able to conceal its existence quite successfully and many of its influential members satisfied to possess the reality of power rather than the appearance of power are unknown even to close students of British history. Secrecy was the cornerstone. No one outside the favored few knew of the, so- knew of the society's existence. Members understood that the reality of power was much more important and effective than the appearance of power because they belonged to a privileged class that knew how decisions were made how governments were controlled and policies financed. They have been referred to obliquely in speeches and books 
as the money power, the hidden power, or the men behind the curtain. All of these labels are pertinent, but we have called them collectively the secret elite. The meeting in February of 1891 was not some chance occurrence. Rhodes had been planning such a move for years, whilst Steed and Escher had been party to the had been party to his ideas for some time. A year earlier, on February 15th, 1890, Rhodes journeyed from South Africa to Lord Rothschild's country estate to present his plan. Nathaniel Rothschild, together with Lord Escher and some other very senior members of the British establishment were present. Escher noted at the time, Rhodes is a splendid enthusiast, but he looks upon men as machines. He has vast ideas and is, I suspect, quite unscrupulous as to the means he employs. In truth, these were exactly the qualities needed to be an empire builder, unscrupulous and uncaring with vast ambition. Cecile Rhodes had long talked about setting up a Jesuit-like secret society pledged to take any action necessary to protect and promote the extension of the power of the British Empire. He sought to bring the whole uncivilized world under British rule for the recovery of the United States, for, making of, for the making of the Anglo-Saxon race but one empire. In essence, the plan was as simple as that. Just as the Jesuit order had been formed to protect the Pope and expand, expand the Catholic Church, answerably only to its own superior general and nominally the Pope, so the secret society was to protect and expand the British Empire and remain answerable to its leader. The Holy Grail was control not of God's kingdom on earth in the name of the Almighty, but of the known world in the name of the mighty British Empire. Both of these societies saw a different kind of world domination, but shared a similar sense of ruthless purpose. In February of 1891, the time had come to move from ideal to action, and the formation of the secret society was agreed. It held secret meetings, but had no need for secret robes, secret handshakes, or secret passwords, since its members knew each other intimately. Each of these initial three architects brought different qualities and connections to the society. Rhodes was a prime minister of Cape Colony and master and commander of a vast area of southern Africa that some were already beginning to call Rhodesia. He was held to be a statesman answerable to the British colonial office in terms of his governance but in reality was a land-grabbing opportunist whose fortune was based on the Kimberley diamond mines. His wealth had been underwritten by brute native suppression, by brutal native suppression, and the global mining interests of the House of Rothschild, to whom he was also answerable. Rhodes had spent time at Oxford University in the 1870s and was inspired by the philosophy of John Ruskin, the recently installed professor of fine arts. Ruskin appeared to champion all that was finest in the public service ethic, in the traditions of education, decency, duty, and self-discipline, which he believed should be spread to the masses across the English-speaking world. But behind such well-serving words lay a philosophy that strongly opposed the emancipation of women, had no time for democracy, and supported the just war. He advocated that the control of the state should be restricted to a small ruling class. Social order was to be built upon the authority of superiors, imposing upon inferiors in absolute, unquestioning obedience. He was repelled by what he regarded as the logical conclusion of liberalism, the leveling of distinctions between class and class, man and man, and the disintegration of the rightful authority of the ruling class. 
As they sat listening to him, those future members of the secret society, Escher and Rhodes, must have thought they were being gifted a philosophical license to take over the world. Cecile Rhodes drank from this fountain of dutiful influence and translated it into his dream to bring the whole and civilized world under British rule. Rhodes entered South African politics to further his own personal ambitions, allied, of course, to the interests of the highly profitable mining industry. Although he paid reverent service to Ruskin's philosophy, his actions betrayed a more practical, ruthless spirit. His approach to Native affairs was brutal. In 1890, he instructed the House of Assembly in Cape Town that the native is to be treated as a child and denied the franchise. We must adapt the system of despotism, such as works so well, such as works so well in India, such as works so well in India, and our relations with the barbarians of South Africa. The sense of superiority that he absorbed in this, in his time at Oxford, was expressed in plundering native reserves clearing vast acres of ancestral tribal lands to suit gold and diamond exploration and manipulating politics and business to the benefit of himself and his backers. Though he associated all his life with men whose sole motive was avarice, his express purpose was to use his ill-gotten wealth to advance his great ideal that the Empire should control the whole world. Before he died of heart failure at the age of 48, and well aware that his lifespan would be limited, Rhodes wrote several wills and added a number of condesils. By 1902, the named trustee of his will included Lord Nathaniel Rothschild, Lord Rosebery, Earl Grey, Alfred Beatt, Leander Starr Jameson, and Alfred Milner, all of whom, as we shall see, operated at the heart of the secret society. Rhodes believed that insular England was quite insufficient to maintain or even to protect itself without the assistance of the Anglo-Saxon people beyond the seas of Europe. In the years to come, problems of insularity insult Insularity, insularity, insularity required to be solved and links with America strengthened. Implicit in his grand plan was a determination to make Oxford University the educational center of the English-speaking world and provide top scholars, in particular from every state in America. With the finance to rub shoulders with every kind of individual and class on absolute equal terms, those fortunate men who were awarded a Rhodes Scholarship were selected by the trustee in the expectation that their time in Oxford would instill the advantage to the colonies and to the United Kingdom of the retention of the unity of the empire. Bob Hawke Prime Minister of Australia, and Bill Clinton, President of the United States, can be counted among later Rhodes Scholars. But this empire maker was much more than just a university benefactor. His friend William Steed commented immediately after Rhodes' death that he was the first of the new dynasty of monk money kings, which has been evolved in these later days as the real rulers of the modern world. Great financiers had often used their fortunes to control questions of peace and war, and of course influence politics for profit. Rhodes was fundamentally different. He turned the objective on his head and sought to amass great wealth into his secret society in order to achieve political ends to buy governments and politicians, buy public opinion, and the means to influence it. 
He intended that his wealth be used by the secret elite to expand their control of the world secretly. William Stead, Hode's close associate in the secret society, represented a new force in political influence. The power of affordable newspapers that spread their views to increasing numbers of working men and women. Steed was the most prominent journalist of his day. He had dared to confront Victorian society with the scandal of child prostitution in an outspoken article in the Paul Mall Gazette in 1885. The details from this graphic from his graphic expose of child abuse in London brothels shocked Victorian society. The underworld of criminal abduction, entrapment, and sale of young girls from underprivileged backgrounds and was detailed in a series of infernal narratives as Stead, as Steed himself described them. These painted a horrendous picture of padded cells where upper-class pedophiles safely conducted their evil practices on children. London society was thrown into a state of moral panic, and as a consequence, the government was forced to pass the Criminal Law Amendment Act. Steed and several of his enlightened associates, including Bramwell Booth of the Salvation Army, were later charged with abduction as a result of the methods used in the investigation. Although Booth was acquitted, Steed spent three months in prison. This was, this is what earned Steed his place in Rhodes Elite Company. He could, in, he could influence the general public, having embarrassed the government into making an immediate change in the law. Steed proceeded to campaign for causes in which he passionately believed including education and land reforms. And in later years, his was one of the most powerful voices, demanding greater spending on the Navy. Steed hoped to foster better relations with English-speaking nations and improve, the, improve and reform British imperial policy. He was one of the first journalistic crusaders and built an impressive network of young journalists around his newspapers who in turn promoted secret elite's ambitions throughout the empire. The third man present at the inaugural meeting of the secret society was Reginald Balliol Brett, better known as Lord Escher, a close advisor to three monarchs. Escher had even greater influence in the upper echelons of society he represented the interests of the monarchy from Queen Victoria's final years through the exuberant excesses of King Edward VII to the more sedate but pliable King George V. He was described as the eminence Greece who ran England with one hand while pursuing adolescent boys with the other. Escher wrote letters of advice to King Edward VII almost daily during his eighth year reign. And through him, the king was kept fully appraised of secret elite business. His precise role in British politics was difficult to grasp even for his contemporaries. He chaired important secret committees, was responsible for appointments to the cabinet, the senior ranks of the diplomatic and civil services, voiced strong personal opinions on top army post, and exerted a power behind the throne far in excess of his constitutional position. His role of power broker on behalf of the secret elite was without equal. Two others quickly drawn into the inner elect of the secret society were Lord Nathaniel Rothschild, the international merchant banker, and Alfred Milner, a relatively little-known colonial administrator who brought order and sense to the financial chaos in Egypt. Both of these men represented different aspects of control and influence. The Rothschild dynasty epitomized the money power 
to a degree with which no other could complete, no other could compete. Alfred Milner was a self-made man, a gifted academic who began his who began his working life as an inspiring aspiring lawyer, turned to journalism, and eventually emerged as an immensely powerful and successful power broker. In time, he led the men behind the curtain. The Rothschild dynasty was all powerful and British and world banking, and they considered themselves the equals of royalty. Even to the extent of calling their London base New Court. Like the British royal family, their roots lay in Germany. The Rothschilds were possibly the most authentic dynasty of them all. They practice endogamy, endogamy as a means of preventing dispersal of their great wealth, marrying not just within their own faith, but also within their own immediate family. Of 21 marriages of the descendants of Mayor Ash Amschel Rothschild, the original family patriarch, no fewer than 15 were between cousins. Wealth begets wealth, never more so when it can provide or deny funds to government and dominate the financial market on a global scale. The Rothschilds were preeminent in this field. They manipulated politicians, befriended kings, emperors, and influential aristocrats, and developed their own particular brand of operation. Even the Metropolitan Police ensured that the Rothschilds' carriages had right of way as they drove through the streets of London. Biographers of the House of Rothschild record that, that men of influence and statesmen in almost every country of the world were in their pay. Long bef Before long, most of the princes and kings of Europe fell within their influence. This international dynasty was all but untouchable. The, Rothschild, the House of Rothschild was immensely more powerful than any financial empire that had ever preceded it. It commanded vast wealth. It was international. It was independent. Royal governments were nervous of it because they could not control it. Popular movements hated it because it was not answerable to the people. Constitutionalists resented it because its influence was exercised behind the scenes, secretly. Its financial and commercial links stretched into Asia, the near and far east, and the northern and southern states of America. They were the masters of investment, with major holdings in both primary and secondary industrial development. The Rothschilds understood how to use their wealth to anticipate and facilitate the next market opportunity, wherever it was. Their unrivaled resources were secured by the close family partnership that could call on agents placed throughout the world. They understood the worth of foreknowledge a generation ahead of every other competitor. The Rothschilds communicated regularly with each other often several times a day with secret codes and trusted well-paid agents so that their collective fingers were on the pulse of what was about to happen, especially in Europe. Governments and crowned heads so valued the Rothschilds' fast communications, their networks of carriers, of couriers, agents, agents and family associates, that they used them as an express postal service which in itself gave the family access to even greater knowledge of secret dealings. It is no exaggeration to say that in the 19th century, the House of Rothschilds knew the events and proposals long before any government, business, rival, or newspaper. Throughout the 19th century, the Rothschilds family banking investment and commercial dealings read like a list of international coups. Entire railway networks across Europe and America were financed through Rothschild bonds. Investments in ores, raw materials, gold and diamonds, rubies, the new discovery of oil in Mexico, Burma, 
Baku, and Romania were financed through the banking empire, as were several important armament firms, including Maxim, Nordenfeldt, and Vickers. All of the main branches of the Rothschild family in London, Paris, Frankfurt, Naples, and Vienna were joined together in a unique partnership. Working in unison, these bran the branches were able to pool costs, share risks, and guarantee each other major profits. The Rothschilds valued their anonymity and with rare exceptions operated their business behind the scenes. Thus, their affairs have been cleverly veiled in secrecy through the years. They used agents and affiliated banks not only in Europe but all over the world, including New York and St. Petersburg. The traditional system of semi-autonomous agents remains unsurpassed. They would rescue ailing banks or industrial conglomerates with large injections of cash take control, and use them as fronts. For example, when they saved the small, ailing M&M Warburg Bank in Hamburg, the enormous financial clout enabled it to grow into one of the major banks in Germany that went on to play a significant part funding the German war efforts in the First World War. This capacity to appear to support one side while actively encouraging another became the trademark of their effectiveness. Though they were outsiders in terms of social position at the start of the 19th century, by the end of the same epoch, the Rothschilds' wealth proved to be the key to open doors previously barred by the, sec by the sectarian bigotry that regularly beset them because of their Jewish roots. The English branch, N. M. Rothschild and Co., headed by Lionel, Lionel Rothschild, became the major force within the dynasty. He promoted the family interest by befriending Queen Victoria's husband, Prince Albert, whose chronic shortage of money provided easy access to his patronage. The Rothschilds bought shares for Alberts through an intermediary, and in 1850, Lionel, loaned Queen Victoria and her consort of sufficient funds to purchase the lease on Balmoral Castle and its 10,000 acres. Lionel was succeeded by his son Nathaniel, or Natty, who as, he who as head of the London house became by far the richest man in the world. Governments also fell under the spell of their malfunct mal the mon munificent money power their mu munificent money power. It was Baron Lionel it was Baron Lionel who advanced Disraeli's liberal government four million pounds to buy the Suez Canal shares from the bankrupt he died of Egypt in 1875, an equivalent of 1,176,000 pounds at today's price. Disraeli wrote jubilantly to Queen Victoria, You have it, madam. There was only one firm that could do it, Rothschilds. They behaved admirably advanced the money at a low rate, and the entire interest of the Khedive is now yours. The British government repaid the loan in full within three months to great mutual advantage. The inevitable progress of the London Rothschilds towards the pinnacle of British society was reflected in Natty's elevation to the peerage of 1885, to the peerage in 1885 by which time both he and the family had become an integral part of the Prince of Wales' social entourage. Encouraged by their generosity, the prince lived well beyond his allowance from the civil list 
and Natty and his brothers, Alfred and Leo, maintained the family's tradition of gifting loans to royalty. Indeed, from the mid-1870s onwards, they covered their, their hair to the throne's massive gambling debts and ensured that he was accustomed to a standard of luxury well beyond his means. Their gift of the 160,000 pound mortgage, approximately 1.8 million pounds today, for Sandringham, for, for Sandringham, was discreetly hushed up. Thus, both the great estates of Balmoral and Sandringham, so intimately associated with the British royalty family, were facilitated, if not entirely paid for, through the largest of the through the largest of the House of Rothschild. The Rothschilds frequently bankrolled pliant politicians. When he was Secretary of State for India, Randolph Churchill, Winston's father, approved the annexation of Burma on the 1st of January, 1886, thus allowing the Rothschilds to issue their immensely successful shareholding in the Burma ruby mines. Churchill demanded that the Viceroy, Lord Dufferin, annex Burma as a New Year's present for Queen Victoria, but the financial gains rolled into the house of the Rothschild. Esther noted sarcastically that Churchill and Rothschild seemed to conduct the business of the empire together, and Churchill's excessive intimacy with the Rothschilds caused bitter comment but no one took them to task. On his death from syphilis, it transpired that Randolph owed an astonishing 66,902 66, pounds to Rothschilds, a vast debt that equates to a current value of around 5.5 million pounds. Although he was by nature and breeding a conservative in terms of party politics, Natty Rothschild believed that on matters of finance and diplomacy, all sides should heed the Rothschilds. He drew into his circle of friends and acquaintances many important men who on the face of it were political enemies. In the, close wor in the closed world of politics, the Rothschilds exercised immense influence within the leadership of both liberal and conservative parties. They lunched with them at New Court and dined at exclusive clubs and invited all the key policymakers to a fam to the family mansions, where politicians and royalty alike were wined and dined with fabulous excess. Collectively, they owned great houses in in Pit in Piccadilly in London, mansions in Gunnersby Park and Acton. Islesbury, Tring, Waddenston Manor, and Mentmore Towers, which became Lord Rosebery's property when he married Hannah de Rothschild. Edward the Seventh was always welcome at the sumptuous Chateaux at Ferreris. Or Alfred de Rothschild's enormous townhouse when enjoying a weekend at the Parisian brothels, Parisian brothels. It was in such exclusive, absolute private environments that the secret elite discussed their plans and ambitions for the future of the world. And according to Neil Ferguson, the Rothschild's biographer, it was in this milieu. It was in this milieu, 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 that many of the most important political decisions of the period were taken. The Rothschilds had amassed such wealth that nothing or no one remained out with the purchasing power of their coin. Remained out with the purchasing power of their coin. Through it, they offered a facility for men to pursue great political ambition and profit. 
controlling politics from behind the curtains. They avoided being held publicly responsible if or when things went wrong. They influenced appointments to high office and had almost daily communication with the great decision makers. Dorothy Pinto, who married into the Rothschild dynasty, presented a tantalizing glimpse of their familiarity with the centers of political power. Pinto recalled, As a child, I thought Lord Rothschild lived in the foreign office because from my classroom window, I used to watch his carriage standing outside every afternoon. While, of course, he was closeted with Arthur Balfour, Foreign Secretary Balfour was a member of the inner circle of the secret society and destined to become Prime Minister. Before he died in 1915, Maddie ordered his private correspondence to be destroyed posthumously, denuding the Rothschild's archives of rich material and leaving the historian to wonder how much of the House of Rothschild's political role remains irrevocably hidden from posterity. Just what would have been revealed in these letters to and from prime ministers, foreign secretaries, viceroys, liberal leaders like Rosebery, Asquith, and Haldane, to say nothing of the all-powerful Alfred Miller, Milner or top conservatives like Salisbury, Balfour, and Estra, the king's voice and ears in the secret society. Ample evidence still exists to prove that all of these key players frequented it, frequented the Rothschilds' mansions. So what did these volumes of correspondence contain? There was no limit to the valuable information that Rothschilds' agents provided for their masters in New Court, which was then fed to the foreign office in Downing Street. Given that members of the secret elite removed all possible traces linking them to Rothschild, would Natty Rothschild's order, what Natty Rothschild's ordered was precisely what was required to keep their actions hidden from future generations. And what of the fifth name, the dark horse, the man behind the curtain? Alfred Milner was a key figure within the secret elite. He was returning home on holiday from his post in Egypt when the inaugural meeting was held, but was already fully cognizant of Rhodes' proposal. On his arrival back in London, he was immediately inducted into the Society of the Elect. Like Rhodes, he had attended Ruskin's lectures at Oxford and was a devoted disciple. Milner was a man who commanded as much loyalty and respect as any Jesuit superior. Superior General. Born in Germany in 1854, Milner, Alfred Milner was a gifted academic, fluent in French and German. Having no source of independent wealth, he relied on scholarships to pay for his education at Oxford. There he met and befriended the future Prime Minister Herbert Asquith, with whom he stayed in regular contact for the rest of his life. Clever and calculating, but without the gift of oratory as a fledgling fledgling lawyer, Milner augmented his salary by writing journalistic articles for the Fortnightly Review and the Pall Mall Gazette. There he worked alongside William Steed, whose crusading journalism appealed to him and whose campaigns in support of greater unity amongst English-speaking nations fostered a deep interest in South Africa. Milner's fervor fervor for the empire and the direction it might take brought him into a very exclusive circle of liberal politicians gathered around Lord Rosebery. In 1885, he invited for the first time, he was invited for the first time to Rosebery's mansion in Mentmore. Within a year, Rosebery was foreign secretary and under his patronage, Milner advanced his career in the civil service. As Chancellor George Goshen's personal secretary at the Treasury, Milner was largely responsible for the 1887 budget. His abilities were admired and respected. 
He was offered the post of Director General of Accounts in Cairo and took it up at at a time when the British government began to fully appreciate the strategic importance of Egypt and the Suez Canal. The Rothschilds handled Egyptian financial affairs in London, and on that first home visit in April of 1891, Milner dined with Lord Rothschild and other highly influential figures within the secret elite. This was precisely the period when the secret society was taking its first steps towards global influence. Yet even at that stage, Professor Quigley could identify Milner as the man who would drive forward the secret elite. Rhodes wanted to create a worldwide secret group devoted to English ideals and to the empire as the embodiment, as, as the embodiment of these ideals, and such a group was created in the period after 1890 by Rhodes, Steed, and above all, by Milner. It was always Milner. Alfred Milner's dy dynamic personality drew like-minded, ambitious men to his side. His impressive organization skills blossomed when, from 1892 to 1896, he headed the largest department of government, the Board of Inland Revenue. Milner was regularly a weekend guest at the stately homes of Lord Rothschilds, Salisbury, and Rosebury, and was knighted for his services in 1895. The following year, he was recommended to the king by Lord Escher as High Commissioner in South Africa, a post he made his own. Perhaps the most remarkable fact about Alfred, later Viscount Milner, is that few people have heard his name outside the parameters of the the Boer War, the Boer War. Yet he became the leading figure in the secret elite from around 1902 until 1925. Why do we know so little about this man? Why is his place in history virtually erased from the selected pages of so many official histories? Carol Quigley noted in a in 1949, that all of the biographies on Milner's career had been written by members of the secret elite and concealed more than they revealed. In his view, this neglect of one of the most important figures of the 20th century was part of a deliberate policy of secrecy. Alfred Wilner, a self-made man and remarkably successful civil servant whose Oxford University connections were unrivaled, became absolutely powerful within the ranks of these otherwise privileged individuals. Rhodes and Milner were inextricably connected through events in South Africa. Cecile Rhodes chided William Steed for saying that he would support Milner in any measures he may take short of war. Rhodes had no such reservations. He recognized in Alfred Milner the kind of steel that was required to pursue the dream of world domination. I support Milner absolutely, without reserve. If he says peace, I say peace. If he says war, I say war. Whatever happens, I say ditto to Milner. Milner grew in, times, Milner grew in time to be the most able of them all, to enjoy the privilege of patronage and power a man to whom others turn for leadership and direction. If any individual emerges as the central force inside our narrative, it is Alfred Milner. Taken together, the five principal players, Rhodes, Steed, Esther, Rothschild, and Milner, represented a new force that was emerging inside British politics but powerful old traditional aristocratic families that had long dominated Westminster, Westminster, often in cahoots with the reigning monarch, were also deeply involved, and none more, none more so than Cecile's family, than the Cecile family. Robert Arthur Talbot Gascoigne Cecile, the patriarchal third Marquis of Salisbury, ruled the Conservative Party at the latter end of the 19th century. He served as Prime Minister three times for a total of 14 years, between 1885 
1902, longer than anyone else in recent history. He handed over the reins of government to his sister's son, Arthur Balfour. When he retired as prime minister in July of 1902, confident that his nephew would continue to pursue his policies. Lord Salisbury had four siblings, five sons and three daughters who were all linked and interlinked by marriage to individuals in the upper echelons of the English ruling class. Important government positions were given to relations, friends and wealthy supporters who proved their gratitude by ensuring that his views became policy in government, civil service and diplomatic circles. This extended Cecile Block. This extended this extended Cecile Block was strictly was intricately linked to the society of the elect and secret elite ambitions throughout the first half of the twentieth century. The Liberal Party was similarly dominated by the Rosebury dynasty. Archibald Primrose Primrose. 5th Earl Rosebery was twice Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs and Prime Minister between 1894 and 1895. Salisbury and Rosebery, like so many of the English ruling class, were educated at Eton and Oxford University. Adversarial, poli adversarial political viewpoints did not interfere with their involvement behind the scenes inside the secret elite. Rosebery had an additional connection that placed his influence on an even higher plane. He had married the most eligible heiress of that time, Hannah de Rothschild, and was accepted into the most close-knit banking family in the world, and certainly the richest. According to Professor Quigley, Rosebery was probably not very active in the, in the society of the elect, but cooperated fully with its members. He had close personal relationships with them, including Escher, who was one of the most intimate friends. Rosebery also liked and admired Cecile Rhodes, who was often his guest. He made Rhodes a, pri a privy counselor, and in return, Rhodes made Rosebery a trustee of his will. Patronage, aristocratic advantage, exclusive education, wealth. These were the qualifications necessary for acceptance in a society of the elite, particularly in its infancy. They met for secret meetings at private townhouses and magnificent stately homes. These might be lavish weekend affairs or dinners at a private club. The Rothschilds residences, residences at Tring Park and Piccadilly the Rosebury Mansions in Mentmore and Marlborough House when it was the private residence of the Prince of Wales until he became King Edward VII in 1901 were popular venues while exclusive eating places like Grillions and even the more ancient the club provided suitable London bases for the discussion and intrigues. These then were the architects who provided the necessary prerequisites for the secret society to take root, expand and grow into the collective secret elite. Rhodes brought them together and regularly refined his will to ensure that they would have financial backing. Steed was there to influence public opinion and Estra acted as a voice of the king. Salisbury and Rosebury were provided, Salisbury and Rosebury provided the political networks while Rothschild represented the international money power. Milner was the master manipulator, the iron willed assertive intellectual who offered that one essential factor strong leadership. The heady mix of international finance, political manipulation, and the control of government policy was at the heart of this small clique of determined men who set out to dominate the world. What his what this privileged clique intended might well have remained hidden from public scrutiny had Professor Carol Quigley not unmasked it as the greatest influence in British political history in the 20th century. 
The ultimate goal was to bring all habitable portions of the world under their control. Everything they touched was about control of people and how their thoughts could be influenced. Of political parties, no matter who was nominally in office, the world's most important and powerful leaders in finance and business were part and parcel of the secret world. As would be the control of history, how it was written, and how information would be made available. All of this had to be accomplished in secret, unofficially, with an absolute minimum of written evidence, which is, as you will see, why so many official records have been destroyed, removed, or remained closed to public examination, even in an era of freedom of information. Summary for Chapter 1, The Secret Society In 1891, a secret society comprising members of the English ruling class was formed in London with the long-term goal of taking control of the world. This organization would have remained unknown had it not been for the research of the eminent American scholar, Professor Carol Quigley. He was given access to information that revealed the conspiracy and its impact on major events in the 20th century. Funded and founded by Cecile Rhodes, a select group of men were chosen for the inner circle or elect that would, severe, that would secretly control British colonial and foreign policy. Other associates were drawn in from time to time and may or may not have known what they were involved in. Two essential components of their shared approach were secrecy and understanding that the reality of power was much more important than the appearance of power. They built on the long-standing power and patronage that the Salisbury and Roseberry families exercised in British politics, but also included the Rothschilds dynasty of international financiers who were very close to the British establishment. In the early years, the leading activists were Cecile Rhodes, William Steed, Lord Esther, Alfred Wilner, and Lord Nathaniel Rothschild. Renewal and strengthening of the bond between Britain and United States of America was a central plank of the secret elite's policy. By the mid-19th century, the House of Rothschilds, based in London, Paris, Frankfurt, and Vienna, dominated European finance. Their holdings branched out across the world into new investments in steel, railways, and oil. Cecile Rhodes' diamond and gold companies were bankrolled by the Rothschilds. The Rothschilds preferred to operate behind other companies so that few realized exactly what and how much they controlled. They targeted and financed relatively indebted royalty, including members of the British royal family. They purchased the Suez Canal shares from Disraeli and gave generously to politicians whom they supported. In Britain, the generosity and patronage broke down many of the anti-Semitic barriers that had to, they had to endure. Nathaniel Rothschild was intimately associated with Cecile Rhodes and his secret society from the outset. The powerful alliance of the money men the men behind the curtain, and the emergence of Alfred Wilner as leader gave the secret elite a cutting edge to make Rhodes' dream a reality.